unless you can read this or this, you're going to need your Bible translated into English or whatever your heart language might be. Picking up a translated Bible seems like a straightforward choice to make. Pick one of the you know myriad of translations and just start reading. They're all pretty good, right? Well, maybe. There is an art and a science to translating the Greek and Hebrew and a little bit of Aramaic into English and at the same time making it readable. In today's episode of Walk the Walk, we're going to look into the variety of translations and see which one might be best for you. So let's get started. If the pictures of the New and the Old Testament in their native forms didn't convince you, let me say it again. The Bible must be translated in order for you and me to read it because we just don't have the facility of the Hebrew or Greek to make any sense of God's Word. Because this series is aimed at English speakers, we can limit our exploration to the infinite variety of English translations. Uh, There are scads of them. Each of these translations has a different target audience in mind, and what connects with you may not be the same as what connects with your spouse or your neighbor. And for the most part, that's okay. I mean, we don't all have to read the same Bible. So long as we are aware and thoughtful of the why and the what and the how of the translation process that went into our favorite Bible, we can make an educated decision about you know, what version is going to speak to us the best. With some exceptions, most translations are good for your personal use as long as their translation process aims to be accurate regarding the meaning of the text and they present this meaning in normal readable English. If this sounds like information that is going to be useful to you, uh, would you consider giving this video a like so that other Christians might get a chance to see it as well? Why the Bible is translated seems to be self-evident. Accepting that the Bible is God's word given in human language during specific times in history, translation is needed simply because you and I don't know Hebrew or Greek well enough to read it so that we can read and understand the Bible. Um, You and I need to have these original words and sentences translated into a meaningful equivalent in English. I add the emphasis on meaningful because it won't do to simply perform a word-to-word structural translation of those original languages to try to put them into English. First of all, the structure of Hebrew and Greek are vastly different from English. The syntax of these languages is much, much different from English. You see on the screen the Greek version of John 3, 16 and 17 with a word-for-word translation laid out underneath. The first thing you notice here is that the relationship between subject and verb is different than it would be in English. It reads, For so loved God the world that his Son, the only begotten, he gave, that everyone who believes on him may not perish but have life eternal. It doesn't exactly roll off the English speaker's tongue, does it? If the translator, in the interest of being accurate, simply put English to the Greek structure, it would be unreadable for us and we would miss out on what God is saying. The ultimate goal of translation is to put a Hebrew or Greek um, biblical sentence into English in such a way that it retains its original meaning. One approach to this is nicknamed Biblish. Um, And this is where the translator simply substitutes English words for the original language words without giving enough concern for how the sentence reads in English. We just saw an example of that up above. For example, a very literal translation is the American Standard Version, and I'm putting that up on the screen here. The 
ASV translates Mark 4.30 as, How shall we liken the kingdom of God? Or, in what parable shall we set it forth? Now that's all correct English, and it is an almost word-for-word translation. But when you and I read it here in 2021, the English sounds stilted and wooden to us. Nobody talks like that. The NIV, on the other hand, aiming for readability foremost, in line with accuracy, of course, translates that same verse like you see. What shall we say the kingdom of God is like, or what parable shall we use to describe it? You can almost hear yourself saying that sentence. Direct translation is good, but not at the expense of readability. Finally, the last thing that we consider when we're discussing translation, the question will inevitably come up is is how do the translators go about their work? The broad answer to this question are available to you at the front of your Bible if you look in the preface uh, or the introduction to the Bible. Uh, For example, in the preface to the ESV, the translation philosophy is explained like this. The ESV is an essentially literal translation. Now that tells us a lot right there. That tells us that they are leaning towards the side of word-for-word uh, ordering and less dynamic translation there. So it is essentially a literal translation that seeks as far as possible to reproduce the precise wording of the original text and retain the personal style of each Bible writer. Uh, Because of this, uh, the ESV's emphasis is on word-for-word correspondence while at the same time taking into full account the differences in in English and Greek, English and Hebrew grammar and syntax, and especially the idioms that we use in English and the original languages. So you have the type of translation that you're reading that you just read in that introduction, but then you dig deeper uh, to find out if this text was created by an individual or by a committee. Then you ask questions of that committee to see if they have you know, like broad denominational representation. They have a variety of theological backgrounds and so on. So that when you start reading in a Bible, you know up front the doctrinal approach that resulted in what you're reading. Now, this is probably not an issue for most Bible readers, you know, unless you find yourself attracted to something awful like the, like the Passion Translation. When you start asking these kinds of questions about that translation, you'll find it best to stay away. Taking all that into account, then, there are two general approaches to translation, form and function. Formal equivalence is the fancy name for a literal uh, or a word-for-word translation. Uh, The guiding force, of course, there is uh, to... Um, preserve the form of the Hebrew or Greek while at the same time producing a nominally or a mostly understandable English sentence. The second approach, uh, functional equivalence, uh, this is also known as dynamic equivalence, this approach seeks to reproduce the meaning of the original text in good readable English. Now it has a little different guiding principle. In functional equivalence, dynamic equivalence, uh, the idea is to produce the most readable text in English. And though there's not going to be a word-for-word correspondence necessarily, the translators work hard to derive the original meaning as it reads in Greek or in Hebrew and then put that into English. We can uh, look at the comparison of these two forms by uh, this example in Matthew 5, 2, where Jesus begins the Sermon on the Mount. So I've taken a highly literal King James, uh, which reads, And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying... So you see a a very close word-for-word correspondence with the Greek. Uh, The NIV 
the new international version um, takes a formal equivalence approach to translation, dynamic equivalence. And so the verse reads more naturally to us, and it reads like this, and he began to teach them, saying, uh, now, that's something like you and I would say, and that's why the NIV is uh, so popular. What we don't see when we, we, what we don't see behind the scenes is that the Greek uses two phrases to express the single action. It says, open the mouth, that's one phrase, that's, that's one word, and teach. And so, if we're literally combining those two, you see how we get a more wooden approach to this. You see in the literal King James, um, or even the more modern ESV, the word-for-word -word approach creates kind of an unnatural but still understandable English sentence. Uh, the NIV, using dynamic equivalence, takes the meaning of the idiom, that is, the phrases together, and then puts that meaning into English. He began to teach. When you're choosing a Bible translation, you're going to encounter a spectrum of different translations. And using the chart I'm putting up on the screen right now to represent this, this kind of spread of translations, those that are far to the left emphasize formal equivalence. And remember, that's, that's word for word translations. Those that are on the far right of the chart are those translations that emphasize uh, dynamic equivalence or thought for thought translations. Some people will also call these a paraphrase because they're taking the original sentence, Hebrew or Greek, they're driving the thought from that, and then they're paraphrasing it into English. Then you look at these Bibles in the middle of the chart, and you're seeing something that we haven't discussed yet, and uh, that's these translations that are hybrids. They fall into kind of a mediating category, and what this means is that they're not fully dynamic equivalent, nor are they fully formal equivalent. This third category takes the best of both of those approaches, kind of a, kind of a middle ground, uh, and then presents an English text that is a nice balance between form in the original language and then the function of what the author was saying. Once you understand that, you understand why the NIV is as popular as it is and why the CSB is becoming more and more popular. So which translation should you choose? Uh, well, the best Bible translation for you to choose is the one that you will read. How about that? There is no perfect choice, and often uh, the perfect choice is a combination of versions. Uh, you know, for example, you might want an NIV or a CSB, um, that's the Christian Standard Bible. Uh, you might want one of those translations to take to church and for Bible study because you get that nice mix of word for word and thought for thought. So you get a nice comfortable reader. Um, to this volume, you might also add a New Living Translation maybe for devotional reading. If you like the text to read closer to the original languages, but don't want the um, archaic language, not archaic, that sounds bad, the more formal language of the King James Version uh, or any of its derivatives, the ESV is a super readable modern translation that leans towards the word-for-word -word structure. Whatever your requirements, please Choose the translation or translations that will encourage you to read the Bible and read it regularly. The subject of translation, we're just skimming the surface here. It goes way deeper than what we've had the time to cover here. Unless you are wanting to go into greater detail about the process and all the decisions involved, this episode should give you the details that you need to make an informed choice when selecting a Bible. Whichever version you choose, with the exception of like the New World Translation or the Passion Bible, uh, read the book. Let the word of the living God feed your soul. Regardless of the word order on the page, 
regardless of whether the idioms translate comfortably or not, read your Bible. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of Walk the Walk, God's richest blessing in your Bible reading.